To understand today's heated debates about how much saturated fat we should or shouldn't eat, it's important to travel back to the 1950s in the Eisenhower administration. I Love Lucy was a hit TV show, Elvis Presley was on the rise, and Marilyn Monroe, Audrey Hepburn, and Marlon Brando were at the height of their fame. At the time, heart disease was considered an inevitable result of aging. But the national conversation changed after President Eisenhower suffered a heart attack in 1955 while vacationing in Denver, Colorado. His physician, Paul Dudley White, was heavily influenced by an ambitious physiologist at the University of Minnesota named Ansel Keys, who was the founder of the Diet Heart Hypothesis. The Diet Heart Hypothesis states that saturated fat causes heart disease by raising serum cholesterol, which leads to plaque deposits in the arteries. This was the reason Eisenhower eschewed butter in favor of margarine in the wake of his heart attack. Eisenhower's low-fat, low-cholesterol diet was widely publicized, though his subsequent heart problems fueled debates about its effectiveness that linger to this day. In the wake of the public's growing interest in heart-healthy eating, Keyes embarked on an ambitious study to prove his hypothesis. Called the Seven Country Study, Keyes and his team followed thousands of men across seven different countries to track the impact their diets had on cardiovascular health and mortality. Starting in 1958 and lasting for 25 years, men in the United States, Finland, Greece, Japan, Italy, Netherlands, and the former Yugoslavia would record detailed data points about their diets and lifestyle. The ultimate findings cemented the position of the diet heart hypothesis at the foundation of American public health, a position it occupies to this day. Keyes and colleagues' data show that men in countries like the United States and Finland with the greatest saturated fat intake had greater incidence of heart disease and death. In fact, heart disease incidence and mortality was 10 times greater in butter-loving Finland than in Crete or rural Japan, locations where dietary saturated fat is very low at just 5 to 7% of daily calories. The Seven Country Study was an impressive piece of research which followed subjects for over 20 years. But rather than settling the saturated fat debate once and for all, its critics have only grown with time. The study, though powerful in its scope, had attracted a growing number of critics over the years, who levy four big allegations. One, cherry picking. The Keys team had access to 22 countries, but chose data from only seven for their study. Two, French paradox exclusion. One of the countries excluded was France, where saturated fat intake was relatively high, but heart disease is lower. Three, Greek Lent. Data in Greece was collected during Lent when meat would have been eaten much less. Four, sugar to blame. Keys and team suppress data that sugar may have played a larger role than saturated fat in developing heart disease. To be sure, the seven country study is not perfect. As an epidemiological study, it cannot prove causation. And the total exclusion of women leaves major holes in the data. Further, Subsequent studies, some of which were inspired by Keyes, have cast doubt on the viability of the diet heart hypothesis and given rise to an ever-growing chorus of detractors. One such study was called the Minnesota Coronary Experiment, a rare, double-blind, randomized controlled trial in the nutrition world. Subjects aged 20 to 97 were living at mental health recovery facilities and a hospital and had all their meals supplied during a five-year period. The study looked at two groups who were assigned different diets which were specifically designed to put the diet heart hypothesis to the test. In the experimental group, saturated fat was just 9% of total calories, and margarine and corn oil 20% of calories. By contrast, the control group was fed a diet consisting of 18% saturated fat calories, and corn oil making up just 5% of calories. At 38% of calories from fat, both diets were high fat by modern standards, and the experimental group ate two times the linoleic acid as the standard American diet. To get the corn oil and margarine to the 20% of calories threshold, liquid corn oil was actually added to numerous food items such as salad dressings, ground beef, milk, and cheese. Yes, you heard that right. The experimental group had corn oil added to their milk. Despite seeing an average drop of 31.2 milligrams per deciliter in total cholesterol, 
the High Corn Oil Experimental Group saw no benefit in total mortality or heart disease events. In fact, in the subjects aged 65 and older, mortality went up as cholesterol went down on the corn oil diet. Ironically, the Keys-inspired Minnesota coronary experiment undermined its own diet heart hypothesis. Rather suspiciously, Keyes and colleagues didn't publish the Minnesota coronary experiment data. The findings were only released years later. The decision not to publish the data for Minnesota is one of the reasons many critics of the diet heart hypothesis impute bad faith intentions to Keyes and his team. 30 years after the Minnesota coronary experiment, bombshell data from the largest epidemiological cohort study ever conducted called Prospective Urban Royal Epidemiology, PURE, further contradicted the diet heart hypothesis. In fact, some say it destroyed it. Published in the prestigious journal Lancet, PURE followed 135,000 individuals aged 35 to 70 years from 2003 to 2013 in 18 countries. The study assessed dietary intake through food frequency questionnaires and the researchers collected data on dietary fats, carbohydrates, and health outcomes, including cardiovascular disease, stroke, and mortality. There was no significant association between carbohydrate intake and cardiovascular disease outcomes. However, high carbohydrate intake above 60% of total calories was associated with higher risk of total mortality. The highest saturated fat group in the PURE study ate approximately 14% of total calories from saturated fat on a diet comprised of 35% total fat. This group had lower overall mortality and lower risk of stroke. Higher total fat intake, including saturated fats, was associated with a lower risk of total mortality and did not increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. While critics of the diet heart hypothesis and Key's seven country study like to point to Pure as the final nail in the coffin for his work, a closer reading shows that there's more nuance here. The highest quintile of saturated fat consumption in Pure ate just 14% of their daily calories from saturated fat. So this wasn't a very high saturated fat group. It was much more saturated fat than the lowest quintile, which ate 3% of calories from saturated fat, which is crazy low. But 14% of daily calories from saturated fat is a very far cry from a lot of the high fat diets that are in vogue in diet circles today. It's a conservative amount of saturated fat. You could argue it's still a low saturated fat diet. And the only difference between the pure study in terms of saturated fat consumption at the highest tier and the US dietary guidelines recommendations on a 2000 calorie diet is just one slice of cheese a day. The difference is very, very, very small. Pure shows us that the US dietary guidelines as they currently stand in the diet heart, heart hypothesis is probably overreaching, but it doesn't stand for the proposition that we can eat unlimited amounts of saturated fat, far, far from it. So where does this leave us? Blanket application of the diet heart hypothesis is an overreach. Good health requires more than just low LDLC. And yet, U.S. dietary guidelines still recommend limiting saturated fat to less than 10% of calories. Data from the Minnesota and Pure studies, as well as others, suggest that is too restrictive for many of us. In her review titled, A Short History of Saturated Fat, The Making of an Unmaking of a Scientific Consensus, journalist Nina Teicholz examines the evolution of the diet heart hypothesis from the late 1950s to the present highlighting potential conflicts of interest and irregularities in scientific reviews concerning saturated fats. Teichel cites heavily to a paper titled Saturated Fats in Health, a reassessment and proposal for food-based recommendations. Published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, JACC, in August 2020. In that paper, the JACC concludes, there is no robust evidence that current population-wide arbitrary upper limits on saturated fat consumption in the United States will prevent CVD or reduce mortality. They are probably right. However, in our tribalized nutrition culture, most will stop there and take away the wrong message, that there is no reason to limit dietary saturated fat ever. Well, not so fast, my friend. The diet hard hypothesis has been over-applied. Most of us have more wiggle room for saturated fat in our diets than the US dietary guidelines suggest. 
But that wiggle room is not unlimited. While the JACC review pushes back against the diet heart hypothesis and the blanket demonization of saturated fat, it recognizes that some of us are saturated fat sensitive, stating the objective should be to match each person to their individual best diet. The human genome was sequenced for the first time as part of the Human Genome Project in 2003, just as the PURE study was getting underway. Information emerging from more recent studies suggests that genetic variants modulate the relationship between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease-related biomarkers. This has been shown for the APOE gene. Carriers of the APOE4 allele show greater fasting and postprandial lipid response to saturated fat, and approximately 25% of the global population carries at least one copy of APOE4. Similarly, variants in the PPAR-A gene, carried by approximately 10% of the population, are associated with poor reactions to diets that are higher in saturated fat. In the case of PPAR-A variants, a diet higher in saturated fat produces the same lipid profile as someone suffering from insulin resistance. This phenotype flies in the face of the argument made in the JACC review that even when saturated fat increases LDL, the particles are large and fluffy. To the contrary, some PPAR-A genotypes see dangerous upticks in small, dense LDL when eating a higher saturated fat diet. Other genetic variants in genes like APOA2 increase risk for obesity on high saturated fat diets. There is no one rule for saturated fat that governs us all. For example, a study conducted in Norway by Lars Redderstahl and colleagues, published in 2010, investigated the impact of genetic variations on lipid responses to high saturated fat diets. Participants were either assigned to a three-week low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet with saturated fat comprising over 35% of calories, or a control group continuing with their normal diet. 30 healthy normal weight participants completed the study. Nine subjects did not complete it due to adverse events and side effects from the diet. The average increase in LDLC in the low-carb, high-fat diet group was 44% but the individual response varied between 5% and 107% increase in LDLC. Some participants ate a very high saturated fat diet and saw next to no change in LDLC, while others saw a massive increase. There was a significant increase in APOB, total cholesterol, HDL, free fatty acids, uric acid and urea in the low carb high fat group versus controls. Studies like Redderstall show us why everyone is wrong about saturated fat and why a personalized approach is desperately needed. No two people react exactly the same way to saturated fats in the diet. Okay, to wrap things up, it's clear that the diet heart hypothesis has been over-applied. That much we know. The low-carb critics of Ansel Keys and his work in the Seven Country Study have a point. U.S. dietary guidelines that recommend 10% or less saturated fat, daily calories, are just too strict for many people. But here's the thing, just because the diet heart hypothesis has been over applied, and just because there are holes in the seven country study, it doesn't follow that there can be no limit on saturated fat, that we can eat as much saturated fat as we want, and that the whole regime of diet heart hypothesis, raising LDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol being causal in heart disease has been debunked because it hasn't. It hasn't. There's still validity to Key's work. It's just that it doesn't apply to everyone. We need systems to figure out who it applies to. In a room of 100 people, you're going to have 30 or so that are going to be saturated fat sensitive. This much we know. These are the APOE4 carriers, PPAR alpha, PPAR gamma, many other genetic variants that contribute to this sensitivity. You're going to see biomarkers look pretty bad on a high saturated fat diet. Another 30 or so people are only going to see moderate, significant, but moderate upticks in biomarkers associated with cardiovascular disease on a higher saturated fat diet. And guess what? The rest of the group is going to see no change. And that, I think, is the big reason why there's so much controversy is anecdotally, person A can find, hey, I didn't have any issue here. And person B can say, hey, I had a terrible time. And both tribes, both nutrition tribes, the extremes on YouTube and in other nutrition conversations just will allow for no quarter for their opponent. It's either saturated fat is all good all the time. There's no cap, doesn't cause heart disease. It's been completely debunked or the plant-based community, even the littlest amount of saturated fat is going to cause you terrible problems. You have to avoid it like the plague.
What that does is it pushes people into eating to get enough calories, low quality grains, refined grains, bad oils, right? And conversely, in the low carb group, it pushes people to do insane things with their lipids, like eat tons of butter and eggs and cheese and be proud of the fact that they have LDL cholesterol of 500 milligrams per deciliter. Neither side is a solution. The only solution really in the saturated fat debate is to realize that some of us are saturated fat sensitive. There's different phenotypes. And as we move forward with personalized and precision medicine, and as we look for better solutions, and as we have more hopefully nuanced conversations, you're gonna find that, yeah, right now, everyone is wrong about saturated fat.